Water movement in a soil is determined by the distribution of potential within the soil profile. Water tends to move from areas of higher potential to ones of lower potential. If there is no potential difference, no movement will occur. The potential at any point results from the action of different forces, mainly gravitational and metric. Water tends to move downward due to gravity and upward due to attraction of solid surfaces called capillarity. Through a series of small experiences, this video will show the basic principles governing water flows. In these demonstrations, soil is held between glass plates so that you can watch what happens as the soil is wetted. The glass plates are 30 cm high and 60 cm wide, with about 2.5 cm of space between for soil. Think of this model as representing a vertical cross-section through the soil. Thanks to time-lapse photographic processes, actions that would require many hours in nature will be observable in just a few minutes. Using a motion picture camera, single pictures are taken every second as the water moves into the soil. The completed motion picture film is then projected and speeded up 25 times. Because water movement is usually very rapid when water is first applied and very slow at later times, the speed up factor might change during a sequence. This will be indicated on the screen. The soil used is an air dried loam which has been passed through a fine screen. Sand, clay and aggregates are used to simulate non-uniform bodies in a soil profile. Water will be added in a furrow with a funnel connected to a tap which keeps the water level at any desired depth. Before the sequences using time-lapse photography, here is a demonstration that illustrates the principle of capillarity. This principle is involved when water moves into dry porous materials. Liquid is pulled because of the attraction of solid mineral surfaces for water, adhesion, and the traction of water molecules for each other, cohesion. Adhesive and cohesive forces are responsible for moving water upward against the downward force of gravity. In this demonstration, water rises between two closely spaced plastic plates because of the adhesive forces between plastic and water and cohesive forces between water molecules. The height of rise is greatest when the plastic plates are pinched tightly together. The pressure in the water above the free water surface in the container is less than atmospheric pressure. This is called tension. The higher water rises, the greater the internal tension. Now to the models and time-lapse pictures. Before analyzing the problems of stratification, it is important to illustrate differences among uniform soils with respect to their ability to transmit and retain water. Note that the depth of penetration at any given time is greatest for the sandy loam which has the largest pores, and least for the clay loam which has the finest pores. The finer the pores, the more the rate of water flow is restricted. Retention of water after the source is removed is greatest in a clay loam, which has the finest pores and least in a sandy loam. Despite this, however, the net useful storage is greatest in a clay loam and least in a sandy loam. Although sandy loam retains less useful water than does the clay loam, it is a good soil in an irrigated area where lack of water holding capacity can be compensated by irrigation. The infiltration properties are generally good. Clay loams, on the other hand, are often difficult to irrigate because of low infiltration rates. In dry climates where there is no irrigation and sandy loam would not hold enough water to carry agricultural plants through the growing season, a clay loam by contrast would retain more water over a longer period of time. Hence, dryland farming on fine textured soils is practical. The rates at which water would enter the soil is an important factor to consider when designing an irrigation system or when deciding on cultural practices for use and erosion control.
Watch as the water moves out from an irrigation furrow. Note that the movement outward is almost as great as that downward. This is added evidence that the force responsible for this type of water movement is mainly due not to gravitation, but to the attraction of solid surfaces. As the soil becomes wetter and wetter, however, gravitation plays a stronger role, and if the soil becomes completely saturated, then gravitational forces predominate. The horizontal layer you see is coarse sand. One of the important principles of unsaturated flow is described as you witness what happens as the wetting front encounters this layer of coarse sand. The pores in the soil are many times smaller than those between sand grains. Water is held in these small pores by large adhesive and cohesive forces. The pores in the soil are like the pores in a piece of blotting paper used to soak up ink. The huge pores in the sand cannot hold water at the tension which exists in the wetted soil above. So, the water does not move readily into the sand. However, as the soil above the sand becomes very wet, the water eventually moves into the sand, just as ink would drip from a blotter which is wet excessively. The sand layer does act something like a check valve, holding the water back until the soil becomes very wet and then letting the excess pass through. What happens to water in soil containing a sand layer is typical in principle of what happens to water in field soils, where sand and gravel occur as layers in finer soil materials. A great deal of agricultural land is layered in this fashion. In Belgium, you can find soil composed of loam overlying Brusselian sands in the Walloon-Brabant province. This layout greatly affects the drainage and the ability to support plant growth as more water can be retained. This is one of the best soils in our regions. Now, in this sequence, you see a layer of fine clay in an otherwise uniform soil. This clay layer is similar to a clay pan, or any type of layer in which the pores are extremely fine compared to the pores in the overlying soil. These layers often restrict root and depths of plants and are particularly known for the trouble they cause in preventing downward penetration of water. When excess water is added to the soil, Water tables are often built up over such layers. If they occur at shallow depth, water tables often rise above the land surface during wet seasons, imposing serious limitations on agricultural use. Despite the fact that a clay pan hinders downward movement of water, it does absorb water readily as the soil above is wetted. Observe the wetting front as it moves into the clay pan. The pores in the clay are much finer than those in the overlying soil, so they can pull water from the soil. Water tables are not built up over clay pans because of the inability of water to enter them. Instead, water tables result from slow transmission of water. The resistance to water flow in these extremely fine pores of layers like these is sufficiently great that even over periods of weeks and months, little water is transmitted through them into the soil below. The pores in restrictive layers found in nature are quite variable. They range all the way from fine pores that allow almost no water to pass, up to pores that are almost as large as those of the overlying soil. The extent to which downward flow is restricted and water storage is altered depends on the finesse of these pores and the thickness of the restricting layer. This is in contrast to what was shown earlier in soil overlying coarse sand layers. There, the downward movement of water was temporarily checked, but water tables could not be built up so long as their opportunity for free drainage into the coarse materials was possible. This model has a sand layer on the left and a layer of coarse aggregates on the right. The pores between sand grains and those between aggregates are large, 
but aggregates are made up of soil particles like those of the surrounding soil. Water movement in soil materials which wet readily depends upon porosity and not upon the chemical or mineralogical nature of the soil material, unless it influences its porosity. Each individual soil aggregate contains numerous fine pores of a size similar to the pores in the surrounding soil. As water approaches these aggregates, note as they wet out as soon as the water reaches them. However, pores between aggregates are too large to hold water at the existing tensions. Hence, they remain empty. All the water must therefore move first to the finer pores of an aggregate and then across the point of contact with the adjoining aggregates. The small number of contacts between aggregates restricts the rate at which water can move. If free water is supplied directly to a layer of coarse sand, water rushes in rapidly filling all the pores. These are conditions of saturated flow. The moving force is due to positive pressure from the water in the furrow. Under saturated conditions, large pores can transmit water readily, with the rate of transmission in the given material depending only upon the hydrostatic pressure of the water supply. The energy derived from this positive pressure is dissipated rapidly over very short distance in the fine pores, giving way to absorb these forces in a drier soil. Water moves out into the soil from the sand layer under unsaturated conditions. It is pulled into and through the soil because of the attraction for water of the middle surfaces making up the fine pores of the soil. The sand in the layer at the left is the same kind of sand through which water is flowing at the right. Here, however, the layer is not in contact with free water or water under positive pressure. The surrounding soil is wetted under unsaturated conditions, where the water is present only under tension. This sand layer cannot wet until the water tension in the surrounding soil becomes very low, which means that the soil becomes very wet. As this happens, the layer takes water. Coarse materials with very large pores aid in water movement only under conditions where they contact free water or water under pressure. Where water exists only under tension, such materials stop or materially retard water flow. The practical applications of principles of water flow to dryland agriculture are shown here. Water moves rapidly into soils with good tilth. Proper tilth practices on the soil on the left have produced numerous small aggregates which have been stabilized by decomposing organic materials. The resulting large pores which remain open all the way to the surface take water readily, thus the infiltration rate remains high. The same amount of organic material when turned under in a layer does little to improve soil tilth and if anything makes conditions worse. On the right, a channel filled with coarse sand simulates an open channel left by burrowing worms or angleworms, or perhaps a channel left by decaying roots of straw. Such channels or cracks do not assist in water movement when they are not connected to a source of free water. The principle involved also applies to tile drains. Water can move into such drains only if positive water pressures exist in the surrounding soil. Hence, tile drains placed in wet soils must be located below the water table if they are to carry away unwanted water and make the land tillable. The straw layer, like a sand layer, checks downward flow of water. In this case, not only does less of the rainfall penetrate into the root zone, leaving more water to run on the surface, but wet conditions in a plowed zone make the soil even more vulnerable to damage, such as that caused by the impact of falling raindrops. Thus, you can understand why soil and water loss by erosion is accelerated.
These demonstrations emphasize the principles of water flow under unsaturated conditions, conditions under which crops are grown on agricultural land. Each demonstration has its counterpart in nature, where it may be less dramatic, but the principles hold and can be seen in operation if one observes carefully. In summary then, unsaturated flow of water in soil and other porous material takes place because of the attraction of solid surfaces for water and of water molecules for each other. How the water moves depends upon the nature of the pores and the porosity changes in the porous system.